Today we're here in the book of Romans. We're in chapter 6. We've been going through the book of Romans verse by verse. We've arrived at verse 15 in chapter 6. And what we'll do is we'll be looking at uh, verses 15 through 23 this morning. And uh, I'll read to you a few verses. Then we'll uh, get an introduction, lay a foundation. I'll review a few things that we've already seen uh, previous to this study. And then we'll move into verse 15. So let's begin reading. Romans chapter 6 at verse 15. I'll read to verse 23 and we'll get into our study. Romans 6 beginning at verse 15. Paul writes, What then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness. But God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you now, you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. In Christ Jesus, our Lord. And so when we were last together, we were noting a few things that I want to use as a foundation so that we can roll into verse 15 and have a grasp of it. Last time we were together, we noted in verse 10 that Jesus had died to sin once for all. It says in verse 10 of chapter 6, the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to God. And so... Jesus' sacrifice that Paul is mentioning is a one-time-for-all-time sacrifice. It's a sacrifice that never has to be repeated. It's a sacrifice that when he died on that cross, that one single time, that was sufficient to satisfy God's wrath and righteous requirements. And so he will not die a second time. This is a witness of the New Testament. Hebrews 9, 27 and 28, for example, says that, as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this the judgment. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time apart from sin for salvation. In chapter 10 of Romans, verse 12, it says, This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. So Jesus Christ died one time for all time. So he says, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But he goes on to say, but the life that he lives, he lives to God. Now, when he says the life that he lives, he's speaking concerning his resurrection and that he lives for God. Now, that phrase, he lives for God, is something that we as Christians are uh, familiar with. Uh, when you speak of somebody who is sold out to the Lord Jesus Christ, we normally say he's, he lives for God. The phrase actually means that he brings glory to God. Jesus Christ brings glory to the Father. Now, that's what he always did, and that's what his followers are to do, is to have habitually bring glory to the Father. But Jesus did that. He always brought glory to his Father. In John 17, verse 4, in what is called his high priestly prayer, this is what he said. He said, I have glorified you on the earth. I have finished the work that you have given me to do. And so he glorified his Father. It was a habit of his life. And his glorifying his father is best seen in his voluntary death on the cross. His yielding of his life on our behalf brought glory to the father. And so in light of Jesus' redemptive work, Christians are to do at least two things. In verse 11, he had said, Reckon yourselves to be dead indeed to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So we reckon ourselves to be dead to sin, both to guilt and domination of sin in our life. And so that understanding gives us motivation to resist the habit of sin. And so, one, we reckon ourselves to be dead to sin, resisting the habitual sinning, and we live in freedom. 
because of the power of sin that's been broken in our lives. Sin's domination no longer has to occur in our lives. You don't have to be the victim any longer. You don't have to, to uh, yield. And I know and, and realize how difficult it can be to be in warfare and to, and to fight the desires of the flesh. But Paul is making it very clear, and it's something that I wanted to emphasize last week, and as I'm emphasizing again this week, it, it is something that we actually can do. We can actually live victorious lives in the Lord Jesus Christ. He had said in verses 6 and 7 of Romans 6, our, our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin, for he who has died has been freed from sin. And so we can have victory in the Lord Jesus Christ. We'll look at that a little bit more in just a moment. But how do we experience this freedom and victory? Well, he had said in verses 11 as well as verse 13, by faith we offer ourselves to God and we don't offer ourselves to live a life of sin. By faith, through his grace, we can live a life of victory. As I mentioned to you, Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. 1 Corinthians 15, 57, thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And 1 John 5, 4, everyone born of God overcomes the world. And he goes on to say this is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. And so we have in Christ the ability to be overcomers. Sin does not have to have dom dominion or domination over us any longer. We yield ourselves to the Lord and he gives to us strength to walk and to follow him. We can do that because we are not under law, he said, but under grace. We can begin to follow the way of the Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit and by the instructions of the word of God. Paul in Galatians 5, 16 through 18 said this. He said, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh and these are contrary the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you desire. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. So we reckon ourselves to be dead, and yet we understand that in Christ we live. And so we've been looking at that here in Romans 6, and we move into verse 15 as Paul continues. And he says this in verse 15 and 16, what then? Shall we sin because we are not under law but under grace? Certainly not. Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness? So he's basically saying this, and we're going to look at this today. This is the heart of what we'll be looking at. God forbid that we should look lightly upon sin. Sin will reign if it can. It cannot be satisfied with any place below the throne of the heart. So what we need to do is we need to learn to habitually yield ourselves to God, seeking Him to give us the strength continually to remain pure. Psalm 19.13 says, Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then will I be blameless, innocent of great transgression. So we ask the Lord, God, in Jesus' name, strengthen us. Now, we already know you've provided those things, but Lord, we also know that our flesh is warring against the Spirit, and, and it's a constant struggle. And, and I'm asking you, Lord, in Jesus' name, to work within me so that I might live a life that brings pleasure to you and one that's blessed by you. Every morning when I wake up, and I encourage you to the same if you're a follower of Christ, I, I encourage you to do the same thing every morning in one form or another within the first few minutes of my awakening is I, I yield myself to the Lord. This is the day that you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, there are going to be some things today that are going to come against me so that it'll try to undermine my walk with you. I, I ask that you just keep me strong today. Lord, I ask that you work within me because the flesh is always desiring to have, uh, have, the, have the, that, that place of, of motivating me to do the things that aren't pleasing to you. And... Uh, I ask the Lord every day, God, in Jesus' name, would you work in me? I encourage you to do the same when you wake up. Because let's face it, the flesh is always rising to the occasion. It's always motivating us, always attempting to have domination. You want to come to church? You, you want to follow the Lord? This morning at second service, people here, there may be some first service people here. You didn't make it, did you? You wanted to come for a service, but something happened. 
Kids, wives, husbands, life, it happens. You wake up in the morning, you get the kid ready to go. The kid goes outside and starts playing with the dog. and he gets all messed up and comes in and you say, I thought you were supposed to be watching him. No, I thought it was your turn. And they're talking about dad and, and the kid does the same thing. And what happens? You didn't make it, and the flesh just rises. It's there all the time. You can come to church, and you know this, and, and you can actually have the wrong kind of thought in church itself. Here, this is where we say, oh, God, oh, God, oh, God, help me. And here you are in church with the wrong thought, a bad thought. Years ago, confession time, years ago, I used to sit in, in church services, you know, 30-plus years ago, and... I would sit in the second row. For whatever reason, I would be in the second row. And, and I can still remember this one Sunday morning as I was about to go up and teach. I would, I would sit in the second row during worship, and then I would just step out and walk up and, and give the study and all. And, and, and I was, it was a time of worship, and I was uh, seated, and I had my eyes looking down. And right in front of me, there was somebody sitting there with long, curly, blonde hair. I still remember. And... Um, and, and wearing jeans and and the jeans were opened up and you could see these lacy underwear and I oh lord I don't need that I don't need that lord oh and I remember just closing my eyes and saying I'm not oh lord oh it's just any I don't oh lord I don't need to notice those things so I didn't even look all I could see was the long blonde hair curly blonde hair that's all I could see and and so I remember, you know, time to get up and go to, to teach, and, and I didn't even look in their direction. I mean, I just got up and, and kept my eyes, and just walked. <laughs> you can't imagine how I felt when I looked down to the front row, and it was a guy. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I am not kidding. I felt doubly bad. <laughs> oh man, cut your hair, Jack. <laughs> but in church, has anybody here ever experienced something kind of like that? I mean, it happens. Even in church, you're coming to the you want to come worship the Lord and the parking guy tells you to park where you didn't want to park. And all of a sudden you're on, in the flesh. We had guys in fights in the parking lot before. Fighting. In the parking lot. Oh, help me, Jesus. That happens. People with the best intentions very often are not aware of the war that's going on within. And, and that's why I encourage you. That's why I encourage you. It, it, is it easy? No, it's not. Why? Because it is a war. It is a war. Because... That flesh wants to dominate, and I have to yield myself to the Lord every day. God's grace covers all sin, Paul says. But there are those who would argue, well, since God's grace covers all sin, then why not continue in sin? I mean, what's the point of even desiring to live a holy life, let alone disciplining yourself to pursue godliness, since, since grace abounds and grace triumphs over sin? Well, why not just live in sin and experience God's grace? Well, Paul is actually answering that when he says we don't continue in sin because grace is intended to set us free from bondage. Grace is intended to set us free from the bondage of sin. And that's why he says in verse 16, Do you not know that to whom you present yourself slaves to obey, you are that one slave? Have you never considered what I'm sharing with you? The question, do you not know, can be a, a statement. Haven't you considered this? I'm speaking to you, he said, about sin. And now, if you thought about it for a moment, you would acknowledge that sin is slavery. And, and by definition, a slave is totally obligated to fulfill the commands of the master. They have no choice. They're slaves. Somebody says, well, that's where you Christians are wrong because I'm not a slave to anything. I have habits and I've got some errors. I've made mistakes. But 
I'm not a slave to anything. How can you say that I'm a slave? And that's where I have a problem with you Christians. Because you say that we're slaves. In reality, we're not. I remember one of my friends who was a slave to sin. And I was trying to share with him the Lord. I was a young believer. I probably was offensive to him unintentionally. I, I don't know. But I know that he got upset at me when I was sharing with him one time. Because he was always complaining. I mean, this man was always complaining. That's what he did. You know, it's, it's a nice sunny day. Yeah, I'll probably get a sunburn. You know, it's just a complainer, you know. And one day I spoke to him and I said to him, you know, you need the Lord, man. You need the Lord. I said, and he says, why? I said, because, bro, you have no joy. And I'll never forget his response. I have joy. I've got a lot of joy. I so, said, yeah, I see it. It's all over you, man. It's all over you. You have no joy in your life. And others, you have no peace. Or others, you have no, you have no love. Others, you have no hope. I do too. I've got a lot of this. I've got a lot of that. I've got, no, no, you don't. That The problem is, is you're blind to yourself. Speak to somebody who, who, is, who likes to drink. Can't go out without a beer or wine or a mixed drink. Talk to them. Some of us were that person. No, I'm not, I'm not addicted to alcohol, man. You know, I, I can stop any time I want. As a matter of fact, I've stopped a lot of times. I'm not addicted to it. Before I got saved, I would have argued that with you. I'd say, look, and I, we used to call it putting down. I can put down any time I want. I don't have to. I remember my, my record, just before I got saved, my record of putting down my drugs was, I think, two days. I think it was two days. I don't remember. <laughs> you can remember you didn't live during that period. I, 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 I believe it was two days. It was at the Monterey Pop Festival. I remember that. I remember dropping psilocybin, magic mushroom. I remember seeing a young man, a young woman, and a little boy or a little girl, I couldn't tell, long hair, blondes, all three of them. I remember seeing that. And their clothing was made out of sheets. And I remember thinking, that's my future if I don't get away from these drugs. And going back to my friend's place, Pacific Grove, they went back for the evening for some more music. And I stayed there and I said, no, I'm, I'm putting down, man. I'm not going to smoke pot anymore. Because I, I thought what was going to happen is I was going to end up like that, that couple and that little child. That was my future. So, so for the rest of that day, I didn't smoke any pot. The next day I did. But I didn't that day. And I felt pretty good about myself. Because you see, I was not in bondage. I could choose to or not choose whenever I wanted. And that's how I argued. That's what I thought. I really believed that. Speak to the alcoholic and ask him in his more sober or her more sober moment whether or not they're in bondage. And if they're honest with you, which sometimes they're not, but if they are, they may very well tell you, I really hate this. I, I hate what I do when I'm drunk. I hate how I speak to people, how I act. But it was difficult for you to get me to admit that. I would just say, that's just life. That's just the way it is. I mean, you know, some people get angry when they're drunk. Some people are happy when they're drunk. It's up to them, you know. For me, this is the way I am. And so I would have people argue with me and tell me, you know what? And you need to get away from that alcohol. It's killing you. And, and I would say, I can anytime I want. I just don't want. It's no big deal. But. If you had talked to me in my more sober moments, then I would have said to you, I don't like what I am when I'm drinking. I don't like what I do. I don't like the, the way I treat people, how I broke my parents' heart, how I've hurt girls, how I've stolen from friends, how I've, I don't like this. And, and, and just before I got saved, a few months before I got saved, I started praying again and I started asking God, 
Well, I actually started telling God, I don't like what I am. I need help. I don't like what I am. I need help. I started doing that once in a while, not always, but once in a while. I don't like what I do to people. I don't like how I am with people. I don't like what I am. What I was saying is, I am a slave to sin, and I do its bidding. And, and I'm in bondage. That's what the Bible says, that we are in bondage to our sin before we get saved. And that's what he's saying in verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin to death or of obedience to righteousness. He's saying if you thought about it, you would acknowledge sin is slavery. And sin is manifested through various kinds of activities, actions. Galatians 5, 19 through 21, Paul says, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of, of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I've told you before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. That all reveals bondage to sin. So we can voluntarily submit our lives to sin, Paul is saying, or we submit our lives to God, but we cannot do both simultaneously. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus said it like this, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is earthly riches. You can't serve two. You have to choose the one you're going to serve. Now, Billy Graham said it like this, We're suffering from only one disease in the world. Our basic problem is not a race problem. Our basic problem is not a poverty problem. Our basic problem is not a war problem. Our basic problem is a heart problem. We need to get the heart changed, the heart transformed. You see, sin, according to verse 16, leads to death, but yielding to God in obedience results in righteousness and freedom. And Jesus said in John 8, 34 and 30 through 36, most assuredly I say to you, Whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. We can be set free. We can be slaves to righteousness. Notice verse 17. God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. You need to see yourself differently. God be praised. God be thanked. We once were slaves. We're no longer. I am set free. I've been set free by the Lord Jesus Christ. I am no longer a slave of sin. I was in a, a, a class in a secular college when I was a young man. And uh, I was speaking to one of my classmates before class began. And it was a social psychology class or something of that sort. And as we were together... He began to visit with me, and, and so I began to give him a bit of a testimony. I began to share what God had done in my life. And uh, I said, you know, I was an alcoholic for several years. He says, oh, what do you mean you were? He said, I'm an alcoholic, though I haven't had a drink in several years myself. But he goes and says what was the mantra then, uh, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. He says, you're always going to have those inclinations to alcoholism. You're only one drink away from returning to a life of alcoholism. And I said, that's where you're wrong. I said, I am not an alcoholic. I was an alcoholic. I said, the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. I said, I am new. I once was an alcoholic, but now I'm set free by the Lord Jesus Christ. See, I don't identify with the old life. I once did these things, yes, and I admit them willingly. And many things that none of, 
none of my family or anybody else will ever know. Only God and I know my true testimony. But I'll tell you this. There are many things that, that I did habitually yielded myself to, just like you. But I do not identify myself like that anymore. That's the old man been buried in Jesus Christ. And the new one is alive because of Jesus Christ. So I can have a life in Christ. I don't have to say, oh, I'm an alcoholic, I'm a drug addict, I'm promiscuous, I'm violent. I don't have to say those things anymore. That's what I was, but that's not what I am. What I am in Christ is brand new, and that's what Paul wants us to know. You are brand new in Jesus Christ. All things are passed away. Understand that and live that. God wants you to know that, and that's how we live. No, I used to do those things. Yes, I did, and worse. And worse, crazy, absolutely. A thief, yes. A liar, yes. But now I'm a pastor. God changes lives. That's what God does. He transforms us. And that's what Paul is telling us. See, I wake up like you every morning, and I can remember things that I've done in the past, and I can dwell on them. Or I can say it's under the blood. It's under the blood of Jesus Christ. Washed, set free. Paul has taught us to do that, and that's what we need to learn to do habitually. It's not denial, it's recognition. Yes, I did those things. Yes, I was guilty of those things. Yes, the penalty for those things is death and judgment. Yes, guilty as charged. But Jesus Christ died on that cross, was buried, resurrected that third day, arose from the dead, ascended into heaven, sent his Holy Spirit to dwell in me, and I am brand new in him. And my name is now in the Lamb's book of life, and I will live as one who understands that. That's what God has called us to, you see. That's what Paul is speaking about right now. We see ourselves differently. You were once slaves to sin, but not anymore. You are brand new in Jesus Christ. In Titus 3, verses 3 through 6, it says, We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior. You see, notice they had obeyed from the heart the message of redemption. God's word had been received and acted upon, and they were transformed from the inside. God's word of salvation occurs in your innermost being, and by his spirit and by his word, he gives you a new heart, which gives you new motives. God says in Hebrews 10, 16, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. You see, some people live laws that are on tablets of stone that they still can read. It's like they're looking at this philosophy and they're saying, those are things I should do, but I don't have the power to do them. But God says, I'm going to write my law on your heart and the things that you do are going to be done from the inside out because I'm going to transform you from within. So we're set free by clinging to and trusting in God and his word and walking in his spirit. Jesus in John 8, 31 and 32 said it like this. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. So he praises God in verse 17. God be thanked. You were slaves, yet you obeyed from the heart. Verse 18, he goes on and he says, and having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just as you presented your members as slaves of uncleanness and of lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. At one time, we were slaves. And notice what he says that we yielded ourselves to. Two words, uncleanness and lawlessness. He said you yielded yourself to uncleanness and lawlessness. Uncleanness is a word that speaks of a moral sense of uncleanness. It speaks of impurity. It speaks of a lust-filled life. You may not have been sexually uh, uh, lustful, but you were lusting for, for power and fame or, or, or money, whatever. That was the motivation of the life. He said, in a moral sense, we had impurity of our lustful living. And then he speaks of lawlessness. 
When he speaks of lawlessness, that's contempt for the law. It speaks of not having moral restraint. That's why in 2 Peter 2.19, uh, Peter said, A man is a slave to whatever has mastered him. That was at one time our way of life. We did whatever our sinful heart desired, but that is no longer the way that we live. Because of grace, we're slaves of righteousness for holiness. We have a new life in Jesus Christ because of his grace towards us. Notice he closes verse 20. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now, having been set free from sin, please underscore that having been set free from sin, having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We pursue righteousness, we pursue righteousness, and we pursue righteousness because, and holiness because God has done a work of grace in our life. So as we pursue a righteous life and a holy life, we are demonstrating that we understand what grace is. The argument is, shall we sin because we're not under law but under grace? God forbid. The response is, grace motivates us from the inside to live a life in pursuit of that which is pleasing to God. So our lives are not going to become worse for grace, but the better. So those who know Jesus Christ do not continue in sin. Not because we have a tablet of laws that we abide by rote, just trying really hard to keep all those laws, because that makes you into what has been called an accidental Pharisee. You actually begin to do things in a structured way so you have the appearance of being righteous and accidentally become a Pharisee who's always nitpicking and looking at other people's lives and saying, oh, you're not... Oh, you can't, you know, you, oh, you said, look at you. And like Jesus said, we forgot that Jesus said, when you point your finger at one person, remember you've got three pointing back at you. If you're busy taking out somebody's speck in their eye, you may want to take that beam out of your own before you help them. But we can become an accidental Pharisee because we're trying so hard to live an outwardly righteous life. But through grace, Listen, God changes you from the inside. He writes his laws on the tablet of your heart. And from within, you have a passion and hunger to follow him. And that's why you don't do the things you used to do. So my friend says, you can't drink anymore because you're a Christian. And I said, I can drink. I don't want to drink. There's a difference. You can't smoke pot anymore because you're a Christian. I could smoke pot but I don't want to. Why? God changed my taste buds and God changed my desires. I don't drink and I don't smoke pot and I don't run around with the girls anymore and I don't do any of those things because God changed my life and he wrote his law on the tablet of my heart and from the inside I now pursue him. You see, the wages of sin is death. But something Charles Spurgeon said one time that I really liked he said, the wages of sin is death, but thank God I quit before payday. <laughs> and that's how it works. Mm -hmm.